Hi, my name is John Wallace, and I'm going to be sharing with you some microwave antenna demonstrations I've developed. They're based on a design by Dr. John Krause from Ohio State University. This is a presentation he gave many years ago to the IEEE. I was lucky enough to see it on videotape, got inspired, and wanted to build it. I started out knowing practically nothing about microwave antennas, and so I needed lots of help. And I wanted to thank a whole bunch of people. Uh, Paul Wade and Dale Clement from ARRL, Alan Roots from SHF Microwave Supply, Kent Britton from PCB Antennas, Richard Bitzer and Carl Leister from the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, Peter Candifer and Chef Robotham from Litchfield Hills Amateur Astronomy Club, Vasek Miglis and Dr. Meredith Hughes from Wesleyan University, Dr. Joe Taylor from Princeton University, Wolfgang Ruckner from Harvard University, Dr. Maddie Herben from Eindenhoven University, and of course, Dr. John Kraus from Ohio State University. At this point, I'm going to cut, and we're going to zoom in on some of the devices that are here on the table so you can see the setup. Before we start, I wanted to show you the devices up close so you can actually see what I'm talking about. So this is the gun diode device, and it, this is the large horn attached to it. It's supplied by this little 8 volt uh, DC supply and you can see it's reading about 8 volts, 8.05. Okay, and so the radiation comes out of this horn and comes down to this end of the table where it's picked up by this little horn which goes down WR, WR90 connector to the crystal detector which converts it to electricity into this device which has the instrumentation amplifier which amplifies the signal and feeds that to a voltage controlled oscillator which changes it to a tone and that comes over to the speaker. Alright, let's talk a minute about safety. Um, this device does give off microwaves. They aren't the ones we cook with but they still can heat things up and especially your eyes are exposed they can be dangerous. So. What I found was the strictest safety standards was about two feet, about here, 60 centimeters, two feet. That will keep you safe, okay? Uh, you'll notice that almost all the experiments I do are on the right-hand side, farther away than that. There are a couple I do at the other end, but I try and stay behind the device so I'm not exposed to that radiation, okay? So keep that in mind if you intend to do something like this. All right. I'd like to start the demonstrations. I'm just going to plug the units in and then I'll meet you down the end of the table. In order to make this video manageable, I've made some assumptions in people's knowledge. And some people may not have the knowledge that I'm assuming. So what I've done is I've created a document that's going to be on the web and it'll include additional information, diagrams, pictures, explanations of how the different demonstrations work, and there'll be additional safety information, as well as some instructions on how I actually built these devices. I hope you check out the SARA website and check out that information if you need it. Before we start, I wanted to explain a little bit about where we're going to do most of these experiments and demonstrations. Um, about halfway down the table, 60 centimeters or two feet from that transmitter, is a point that's called the beginning of far field. Everything down here is far field. And what does that mean? It means that the radiation coming out of that horn, when it hits that point, it's now plane waves. It's coming out as plane waves. And those are much simpler to uh, understand and predict what's going to happen. So we're going to keep most of our demonstrations down here. Up there in near field, you have interactions between the electric and magnetic fields, and it becomes quite complex. So we're going to keep most of our stuff down here where everything is plane waves and pretty much like you'd find in a classic physics book. The other thing I want to talk about is when you listen to the signal. So you'll hear a tone, and you'll hear that tone change. The pitch is related to the signal strength coming in. So the higher the signal, the higher the pitch. The lower the signal, the lower the pitch. So here, very high signal and it tapers off. Okay. The first thing I want to talk about is beam width. And in this case we're going to be looking at what's called the half power beam width. So we're looking at where the thing goes from 
full power down to half power. Okay? And basically for us, it'll be where our nulls will be. You'll hear the noise go down quite a bit. All right, um, let's take a look at that. We have a small horn, so when I put it in here, I can turn it quite a distance before it tapers off. And if you calculate it out, it's about 58 degrees. Okay, so very wide beam width. Okay. If I want to narrow it, what I have to do is get something that gathers a lot more radiation and pulls it in at a much sharper angle. So this is a horn that's 32 times bigger. So it gathers a lot more radiation. And when you see, first of all, it's going to be much louder. But if I turn, you notice that it's behaving very narrow. It's about 22 degrees this time. So roughly half of what we had last time. So by adding bigger and bigger horns, we can get narrower and narrower and narrower views of what we're observing. Next, I'd like to take a look at gain. And gain is related to area. So we have a very small area here. And you notice it's pretty good gain anyways. It's pretty good. This is about 6.8 dB. dB is a log scale, so it's base 10. So that's a fair amount of radiation coming into this horn and being gathered. But if I put this on, it's 32 times more area. So that means there's a lot more gain. In this case, it's 16.6 .6 dB, which is a lot of gain. And I'll sort of try and give you an idea how much, by, but I can't stay there long because it's going to peak out the meter. See, it's as much as this thing can take. Uh, so this horn, putting this on, gives you tremendous gain. And we'll talk more about gain in a little bit. Next, let's talk about the inverse square law. That's a common law that's studied in optics. And this is a sort of an optic demonstration. So let's uh, take a look. It says basically that if you move a receiver twice as far away, it should have four times less signal. And that's related to the area that the signal is covering. So let's take a look up close here. We have a really high signal. Hear how high that signal strength is? And if I move out, it goes to about there and over to about here. The other thing is we can go up and down. I can't go all the way down because of the table. But you can see it's about this big. If I bring it back here twice as far away, Listen to the signal strength. It's much less. It turns out that's four times less signal strength. Let's bring it out here. So about this wide, and let's go up. So here we are again. This time, look at how much bigger that is. That's two times two, or four times the area, so the signal strength is four times less. All right, let's take a look at polarization. That horn up there is designed to give off an electric, electric wave that's in this direction, vertical, and the magnetic is horizontal. Well, this one, when I have it in this direction, I'm detecting that vertical electric signal. What happens when I turn it? So at 90 degrees, it cuts out completely. This is called linear polarization. It's in a line. Okay? And we can take a look at some of this by playing a little bit with this paddle that I made. It's got a grid ground into it. All right? And there's more details on the website about this. But let's put this in front. When I was growing up and went through my first physics class, they talked about ropes going through fences. And when it was vertical, the vertical fence posts it could go through, and horizontal it got stuck and bound up and couldn't get through. So let's try that. If I put this vertical, what happens? Nothing. Okay, something's wrong with that logic. In this case, we have an electric signal that's coming vertically at us. When these are vertical, notice that the electricity can actually flow through these long lines. 
Okay? So it is giving it a path to flow so it doesn't go through. If I turn it this way, the path is very small, these little tiny distances. So most of it will pass through. So we want it to be horizontal. And you notice what happens as I turn it. Cuts off. Okay? Another interesting thing we can show is if I turn it 90 degrees, no signal. But if I put this in and start turning it, watch what happens. We're getting a signal. This device can actually rotate the waves. So it's kind of interesting that we get that. All right, I have a device I want to use right now to see how much we've learned. And it's a hidden device. So we'll see, when I put it in front, like this, I'm getting no signal. All I'm going to do is flip it. Flip it. I get a signal. Flip it again. No signal. Flip it. Signal. Okay. In electronics, something that passes in one direction but not the other we call a diode. What do you think? Is this a diode for radio electronics? No. This is a trick demonstration thing. What I've done is I've got a grid that's like this. It's made at 45 degrees. So when I hold it like this, it's vertical. When I flip it, it becomes horizontal. I wanted to explain a little bit more detail how this works. Inside is a grid, very much like we had seen before. And when I was holding it like this, it allowed the radiation through. So the grid was lined up like this. When I flipped it, it ended up lining up like this so that no radiation could get through. And I wanted to show you how that works. Basically, I have my stick here, and right here, no radiation can get through. When I turn it, notice what happens. It flips to horizontal, and the radiation can pass through. Flip it again, back to vertical, flip it again, back to horizontal. So that's how that works.